Uh, again, uh, we be really began with the church at Ephesus, and remember, that's the church that left their, their first love. So their problem was a, a problem of priority. Uh, it, it, uh, again, the first love meaning that Jesus should be the first thing that, uh, in terms of priority of their lives. They were doing incredible things for the Lord. If you would read that list of what Jesus commends them for, you would think, man, I'd like to have a ministry like that or be a part of a church like that. But evidently it's possible to do a lot of things for the Lord, uh, but really forget why you're doing it. And, uh, and so motivation and priority was a, certainly a concern there. Smyrna, we looked at uh, uh, again of last week, and that's the church that was facing tremendous persecution, and we kind of gave you the history of what in fact did happen to the church there. And, and uh, we remembered... Uh, uh, Polycarp in particular, who was one of John's apostles, who himself in his late 90s was uh, burned at the stake. And what Jesus said they were going to go through, they certainly did. And, uh, and so he reminds them to remember the resurrection, that we're going to have an eternal perspective. And, uh, and again, we've mentioned that there were more people martyred for their faith, more Christians martyred for their faith in the 20th century than any other century before. It's not decreasing, it's increasing in persecution around the world and even in our own country has increased uh, uh, like uh, I don't think anybody would have ever dreamt of just 20 or 30 years uh, ago. Uh, Pergamus, uh, there's uh, a different concern here. Uh, and the concern is one of compromise. We'll give you a little of the history of the, of the city and, and the, uh, the church there to maybe help put things into perspective. Uh, just one little quote as we get started by, from a book called The Holy Longing in regards to this idea of compromise in, in our own lives. Uh, this writer says, We want to be a saint, but we also want to feel every sensation experienced by sinners. We want to be innocent and pure, but we also want to be experienced and taste all of life. We want to serve the poor and have a simple lifestyle, but we also want all the comforts of the rich. We want to have the depth afforded by solitude, but we also do not want to miss anything. We want to pray, but we also want to watch television, read, talk to friends, and go out. It's small wonder that life is often a trying enterprise and that we are often tried and pathologically overextended. Uh, again, that could even go to last week, the idea of priority, but certainly, again, the church at Pergamos, Pergamos the uh, idea here is, is one of compromise. It's located 55 miles north of Smyrna, 15 miles off the coast of the Aegean Sea. And, uh, and again, it's, uh, let me go through the history a little bit. You may have not liked history when you were in school, but... This is some history that's, that's pretty interesting and very pertinent to what, uh, what uh, John has to say. Again, Jesus has to say uh, to this church. 29 B.C., Pergamos was given permission to erect and dedicate a, a temple to uh, Augustus, making it the official Asian center for the imperial cult. And we talked about that last week because, again, the church at Smyrna... Uh, was one of the places where the first altar was built to a Roman emperor who declared himself uh, to be deity in, a, in his own lifetime. And everybody was required then in every official Roman city to go to the altar to the emperor once a year and burn incense and say that Caesar is Lord. Of course, that's a problem if you're a Christian because of the fact that that uh, you could only say that Jesus is Lord. It was a huge problem uh, in the early church. Uh, what happens to the people that say or take the position, well, I'm, I don't really believe it. I'm just going to say it because I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to be killed. I'm just going to burn the incense and say Caesar is Lord and walk away and ask the Lord to forgive me. And many did that. Uh, how does the church deal with that? What do the church elders have to say about that? It was a huge problem when you have people going to their death over, over the same thing. Uh, so you had that in, in Smyrna, but in Pergamos it's, uh, it's, it's worse because of this particular idol that's, uh, that's there. Uh, it's the first temple dedicated to the worship of a Roman emperor. Uh, and therefore, this was ongoing, and the danger to the Christians in this city was a danger Every day, not just once a year, but every day they were in danger because of this temple that was there. Had a great university, 
over 200,000 volumes, which are, were eventually sent to Alexandria, to the uh, library there by Mark Anthony as a gift to Cleopatra. So a couple other historical figures playing the part of, uh, of this city. Uh, it's, it had a, uh, Pergamus had a, an Acropolis at the top at about 1,000 feet. Now, if you think about the poly, uh, not the highest peaks, but just the typical, what you look at the Kohl Laos, it's about 1,000, 1,100 feet. So you can imagine if you looked up towards the poly and right on the crest at the top, overlooking Kailua, there was this uh, huge Acropolis built up there of white marble glistening uh, in the sun, could be seen from, uh, from miles away. Uh, and then on the top of that at the Acropolis was a huge altar uh, to the god Zeus. And, uh, and again, the, the head of the pantheon of gods of the, uh, of, of the Romans. And um, uh, one of the things uh, a short distance from that was a, a temple to the goddess Athena and, uh, and many others. But again, the altar of Zeus was at, at about 800 feet, just a little below uh, the Acropolis. And uh, uh, there was also a, uh, was known for a school of healing. There was the, the god of healing, uh, Asclepius was, uh, was his name. Uh, great, uh, uh, great school of, uh, of medicine that was there. Now, very interesting because uh, his logo or his image was a snake on a pole. It is exactly the image that you see associated with the uh, American uh, Medical Association. Their logo is exactly what came off of this temple, this uh, first school of medicine. They also had a school of psychology first one that we that we know about and it, very interesting some of the uh, uh, some of their methods their primary method was if you had emotional problems psychological problems you would go there you would go through their healing quote baths and maybe get a massage and so forth and then you would walk into a tunnel uh, and then above the tunnel there was uh, pukas uh, every so often and you would walk through and you'd walk to that first opening and then your psychologist would stand above you and whisper and talk to you and discuss your problems with you. Oh, my life is terrible and oh yes, it probably is. And <laughs> he would kind of agree with you and you, and you would walk to the next opening and he would meet you there. You would never have to see the guy anyway, but you would just hear this voice and then he'd begin to encourage you. Oh, things aren't so bad after all. And think about this and remember this and so forth. And, uh, and then by the time you, you, you would reach these progressive openings as he's encouraging, and then the last one, he, he would pronounce you healed of uh, all of your uh, emotional problems. So the first school of psychology in, uh, in the world. But uh, again, uh, worship of the emperor was very, very strong there. And as a result of that, uh, these Christians were in danger uh, each and every day. Let's jump into the text and we'll have more to say about these temples and what's going on as it relates to uh, to the text there in verse 12. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful uh, martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So again, a, a similar pattern to the other churches, and so we note in verse 12 or 13 that Jesus communicates his message to the church of Pergamos, and he does that uh, by mentioning the fact that he is the one, again going back to his description in chapter 1, uh, that has the double-edged sword. We, when we were in our uh, study on uh, spiritual warfare, and Paul talks about the, the sword of the Spirit, he uses a different word, machaira. It's a, a smaller sword that the Roman soldier would use. This sword would be like the broad, what we call the broadsword, large, double-edged, you know, two, two hands on the, uh, on the handle at once, uh, similar to what a lot of the, quote, barbarian uh, tribes would use and so forth. 
Uh, and the idea is that if you get hit with this, it's all over. Uh, and, uh, and so it speaks of the severity of the situation. You can read through Isaiah, and many times Isaiah is prophesying about God's judgment coming, and it's described as a sword that is coming uh, upon the people. So the first thing that Jesus has to say is communicates there's, there's something so radically wrong here, there's a real severity in judgment that's coming. And, uh, and so we see a distinction between that and some of the things uh, said about uh, the opening letters of the other churches. And then and even maybe even more startling to that, he communicates his knowledge of Satan's throne. So to say that this city had great satanic conflict would be the, uh, the understatement of, uh, of the year. Let's go back to this idea of the altar of Zeus. Uh, the altar of Zeus is traced directly back to the worship of Baal or Baal, which we see throughout the Old Testament. Constant problems for uh, the Israelites, constant problems uh, in terms of people uh, going after the Baals and worshiping them uh, and committing what the Bible would call spiritual adultery with these other gods. And we're talking about child sacrifice and, and some very horrific things that are involved with, uh, with these kind of uh, worship, <coughs> worship centers. Very interesting as you kind of watch people in this country kind of seek after different um, offshoots of Hinduism. And um, I can tell you one thing, <clears throat> they don't know a lot about Hinduism. <laughs> and they've never been to India and seen blood sacrifices, uh, seen the, the child, what I would call the child sex trade and prostitution that goes on within these temples there, all part of this worship. Uh, there are some horrific things that are done uh, in the name of gods, uh, and certainly most of them, we could almost say all of them, trace back in one way or another this idea of the worship of Baal, uh, and, uh, or Baal, and certainly the, the altar of Zeus, we know historically, uh, it traces its roots uh, to that, and then eventually from that back to ancient, ancient Babylon. Uh, the religion of the ancient Babylonians was very similar to what we would call the New Age movement today. And uh, by the time that, um, that uh, Babylon is being sacked and overridden, those priests in that temple there of ancient Babylon then grab their idols and grab their implements and, and head out of town, uh, and they go to uh, uh, another city. And what city did they settle in? Pergamos. That's where they, they go to. So you have the ancient Babylonian re religion basically now transported from Babylon uh, over into western Turkey. Eventually, uh, they make their way across the Aegean Sea, and they center and settle in another city we're familiar with, Rome. And that becomes uh, one of the centers of their worship is, as well. Their high priest took the title Pontus Maximus, the great bridge builder. Now, some of you, if you, you've got a different church background, may be familiar with, with that title. Uh, one of the big things about it is that Julius Caesar, <coughs> one of the probably better well-known emperors of, <coughs> of Rome, buys into all this and becomes a high priest in the cult. So he's the first Roman emperor that, that is the emperor of Rome that is also a priest in this religious cult that traces its, uh, its uh, ancestry to the worship of Baal and also to the worship, eventually, it all comes out of ancient, ancient Babylon. Excuse me. Other Roman emperors follow in his case from Julius Caesar to Constantine. They all then take the title Pontus Maximus. <clears throat> in 476, Rome is sacked there are no more Roman emperors at that point in time, 476, another, again, 300 years or so after the, the writing of this letter. By now you have a church uh, established in Rome, and the pastor of that church, because there's no Roman emperor using that title, tracing its way back to an ancient cult in Babylon, because they are not using the title, that pastor over that church that sees himself because he's in Rome, he likes to see himself as over all the other Christian churches. He takes the title Pontus Maximus, and that title continues to be used from the Church of Rome today. Current Pope takes the title Pontus Maximus, the great bridge builder. It goes back to Mystery Babylon and the ancient religion of, 
of, of Babylon. So there's uh, some very interesting things going on in this city, but the religious cult that's there that is tied directly with this altar of Zeus, which was huge and could be seen for miles and miles away, has a religious system that Jesus says is the throne of Satan. That wouldn't be real encouraging if we got a letter today and uh, Jesus sends us a letter. And by the way, where you live in your city, <laughs> that's the throne of Satan. That's where he lives. Uh, that might come as a little, a little bit of a shock. It may not have been a shock to these guys because they were living there. I think it was easy to be a Christian in Pergamos. I mean, as we go through these cities, it kind of goes out of the frying pan into the fire and, uh, uh, in, in many ways. But uh, it's to this church that Jesus speaks as a sword, emphasizing the severity of judgment that's coming, and he speaks to them as a place of Satan's throne. And uh, I've got a verse for you in Revelation 17, because this whole issue comes up again later in the book. And uh, we've probably mentioned this verse already once, but uh, John would say later in verse 3 of chapter 17, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Uh, and not to go into all of the symbolic language here, but here's a woman who represents the false religious systems that will dominate the earth during the tribulation period. And that false religious system gets traced all the way back to to Rome, to Pergamos, the worship of Baal, to ancient Babylon. Uh, so, so again, if you take all religious systems and boil them down to uh, their utmost simplicity, it would be this. There is the religious system that says God is the creator and the designer without. Uh, and, uh, and I need and I desire to worship him and to somehow know him. And then you have the religious systems that says God is within and I am, I am God myself, and I just need to realize that. And, and you can call it Christ consciousness. The Hindus call it many other things. But that system that denies the creator God uh, is basically traces its heritage, all of them, all back to ancient Babylon. And, uh, and Jesus says, because that's going on in this city, it's the center of that type of worship in the world at that time. He says that's where Satan's throne is. And also Zeth says that's where he, where he lives. So this idea of ancient Babylon will, will play out more as we get into the tribulation uh, period. And finally notice verse 13 that Satan not only has his throne, but he actually lives there. Satan is a powerful being, but he is not God's equal. He is not omniscient. Uh, he is not omnipresent. He cannot be in every place at once. He can only be in one place at once. Uh, he is a being, and apparently he lives in that particular city. You may come home one day and tell your wife or tell your husband, man, Satan was after me today. I can't believe what a terrible day that I had. Probably not true. <laughs> he's probably busy with uh, the, the, the head of state somewhere, or he's over there uh, whispering in the ear of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad or somebody else like that. He is a finite being. He can only be at one place at one time. And apparently, according to Jesus, at this time in history, he lives and headquarters himself in this particular city. Tough place to be a Christian. I know sometimes when we've gone on missions trips, I felt like we were entering the dragon's throat or whatever, but uh, I don't know where he lives today or he dwells today, but at this time it's in the city of Pergamos. So Jesus communicates a message to the church, uh, and secondly, he commends them in two areas. Like the other churches we've seen, they've commended, are commended for their works, the good things that they're doing for the Lord, and we're again reminded of Galatians 6, 9, that the Lord sees everything that we do. Uh, nothing goes without him noticing it, 
anything we do for the Lord. That's true of these churches. It's true of us. And secondly, they're commended for their loyalty under persecution. Notice he says, and you hold fast to my name. So they held fast to his name even when one of their uh, brothers in the Lord, a man named Antipas, was, was, uh, was martyred. So they had personal loyalty. Again, what were they loyal to? It was to the name of Jesus. And it's one of the great battlegrounds that we face today. The name of Jesus, that he is God come in the flesh, that he is the only way of salvation. That's a battleground. Uh, you and I, if you try to share your faith with, with others, you'll find that uh, you will be challenged to the fact, are you personally loyal to the name of Jesus Christ? Because you can get along with everybody else a lot easier if you're not. If, you, if you'll back away from the deity of Jesus Christ, what do all cults have in common? They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. What does the new age have in common with those cults? They deny the deity of Jesus Christ. If you'll back away from the deity of Jesus Christ, if you'll back away from Jesus being the only way to have salvation, you can get along with just about everybody. <laughs> you'll be accepted with about everybody. It was a challenge to them, <clears throat> unlike anything that we'll probably ever come against or have to understand, but it's an issue of personal loyalty. Will we be loyal to the name of Jesus Christ when we share with others, when we talk about our faith, when we talk about the Lord? Will we back down when we're challenged this issue? Don't tell me that. There's got to be many roads that lead to God. After all, God is not in competition with himself. My new age friends used to tell me on a regular basis after I first got saved and started telling them about Jesus Christ and how they could have their sins forgiven and have a personal relationship with him. They said, that's good for you. You have your way and I have my way. <laughs> you know, as, as though these two ideas some, could somehow both be true. And I would have to come to the realization and eventually tell them uh, either, either what you have is the truth or what I have is the truth, but we both cannot be true because these views are in contradiction to each other. And you and I have to decide like they had to decide, and they're being commended under these circumstances for their personal loyalty. Look at Matthew 10, what Jesus says there, uh, verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men... Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. This idea of holding fast, being personal, loyal to the name of Jesus Christ. It's very important. Paul says in Romans 10, 10 9, a verse that we use sometimes in sharing the gospel, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Personal loyalty, holding fast to the name of the Lord Jesus. Are we loyal to his name? Secondly, they're commended also for this idea of public confession. Uh, it says, and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. So there was not just something that they believed in their hearts. It wasn't just something they held to in their minds. Again, it was something that they publicly confessed. And I would say this is a very tough environment to, <laughs> to publicly confess Jesus. Where Satan lives, where his throne is, where this incredible satanic worship is going on uh, night, uh, night and day. You think they hung under those words of Paul that uh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, to some degree, it's, it, we deceive ourselves if we think that, that uh, we don't face, at least to some degree, that's, that kind of hostility out there each and every day. We can ignore it or we can prepare our hearts for it every day when we, when we go to face the world. Some of us face a more hostile environment than than others. That certainly, that would uh, that is clear. I was uh, watched to got to see a little bit of the uh, the All Star game uh, this this week, and um, I was uh, I was reminded as I watched uh, the the opening lineup. I I certainly could say to people that keep up with baseball anyway, who is the greatest hitter in baseball currently? Who is he, Pete? 
Albert Pujols, and who is a great outspoken Christian for his faith in Jesus Christ? Albert Pujols. If you go to his own website, it opens up with a worship song playing, and the banner across the top of the website says, Faith, Family, Others. He's got a whole foundation. He has a, uh, he has a child that has Down syndrome. He's, de- he's dedicated a lot of his time and energy and treasure into investing uh, into kids and helping families uh, in that particular uh, situation. He takes people on short-term missions trips. He's, he's, a, he's a solid brother in the Lord. Now, what's interesting, uh, not just in baseball, but in, uh, in athletics in general, it's, it's pretty okay to be a Christian, uh, which is kind of a good thing. It's not a hostile environment. Nobody hassles them over it. They interview them. They share their testimony. They praise the Lord, uh, whatever, it, uh, whatever it might be. And it's kind of okay. Uh, would that be different if they were uh, uh, in the media, university professor? Politician. Now, see, there's some environments it's a lot more hostile than others. This is a very hostile environment that they were in. Uh, sometimes in some places, it's easier for us to take a stand for Jesus Christ and to personally be loyal to his name than in others. But Jesus commends these men and women and children because in the most radical environment, they still, they still were personally loyal to him and willing to publicly confess him no matter what it costs. And certainly, we don't live in that radical of an environment. Most of us will probably never face this kind of hostility. Uh, And certainly, the Lord would commend us if we could do the same. So he commends the church for their works, their personal loyalty. The third thing, he condemns them for two doctrines in which they've compromised. And the first is he condemns them for the doctrine of Balaam. What's the doctrine of Balaam? Well, it goes back to Numbers 22 to 25. Do you remember Balaam was a prophet in one place in a text? It says really he was a soothsayer. Uh, and so he was not one of the Israelites. He was not Jewish. He was not one of God's people. He didn't have any divine revelation. He only had general revelation. But he have apparently had some, some relationship with the Lord where he would listen to the Lord and be able to say what the Lord said. Um, and so... When the children of Israel are, are coming again uh, out of the Sinai and uh, initially into the land, then you've got uh, Balak, who is the king of Moab. They're coming into Moab. He's looking at a million plus or whatever, very concerned over them. So he goes to Balaam and says, will you curse them? You know, and I'll pay you to curse them uh, because I'm, I'm concerned over they may invade my land and so forth. And you remember the story. He says, uh, well, I can only say what God tells me to say. And, uh, and so he says, well, I'll give you this much money. Uh, he takes the money, and then he blesses the people. He says, that's not what I'm paying you for. This whole thing goes on. And uh, in a way, it's, uh, it's an interesting story because you've got, you've got uh, uh, Balaam who's trying to get the money. He wants the money, uh, but he realizes his, his limitations. In, in Numbers 31... He advised the people of Israel to commit immorality with the women of Moab, to participate in their pagan uh, rituals and so forth. So he couldn't really curse them, but he could, he could find a way that they would be cursed by God by entering into pagan rituals with these gals, uh, in entering, which involve sexual immorality. Again, a lot of the, uh, the worship of these ancient religions involves sexual immorality. And, uh, and again, so what's meant in terms of the doctrine of, of Balaam in John's day? Well, I think it means this. Uh, you walk softly on the issues of immorality. It doesn't bother you when, when Christians and non-Christians intermarry, and even if it goes to the compromise of being involved in other religious services that are really opposed to, to your faith in Jesus Christ. What do you do? If you live here, if you grew up here, which some of you did, and you're Japanese, and you go to your family's next funeral, which is in a Buddhist temple, and you're being asked to go forward with all the other family members, looking at a, a lot of holy faces out here, so that's, this is what happens, but I mean, so, but not all. Some of you know from personal experience, <laughs> your father, your grandfather, your uncle, or somebody is going to say, you need to go forward with everybody else and burn your pinch of incense to Buddha along with everybody else. You're going to have to take a stand for Jesus Christ. 
uh, or, but again, the problem here was in that city, those Christians, though they were commended for certain things, they're being condemned for this thing, the doctrine of Balaam. Apparently they were willing, some of them in the church, certainly we'll see not all of them, but some of them to compromise when it comes to these kinds of things, to compromise in the area of being willing to marry a, a non-Christian, to be unequally yoked, and being willing to walk softly or not say anything against sexual immorality. And certainly we, we, we get it all the time. If we comment on it, what's going on, we even change the language around. People don't commit adultery anymore, they have affairs. Uh, you know, as though that changes, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's going on. And we live in a day and age in which if we say anything, then we are criticized rather than them. And, uh, and, and the personal attacks uh, then ensue. Listen to what, uh, what Peter says about these false teachers uh, and their connection with, with Balaam. There's a couple of passages in the New Testament that deal with this area of, of Balaam and, uh, and, and what happened there in uh, ancient Israel. Peter says in 2 Peter 2.13, uh, they are spots and blemishes, these false teachers, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery uh, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in, in covet, uh, covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. What are they doing? They are following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. And that's kind of a fun, fun story, you know, because, you know, Balaam's willing to charge ahead. God's telling him, don't go. And he's like, no, I'll go. But uh, I'll still only say what you say because I want the money that's in his heart. Peter tells us this. We find it in, in the story in the Old Testament as well. And you remember uh, the donkey is trying to prevent him from going forward and going into more danger and more compromise. And he's beating uh, the, the donkey. And finally the donkey turns around and starts, uh, starts speaking to him and warning him and so forth. And of course, if a, if a donkey begins to speak to you, you probably stop and listen to see what he has to say. And that's meant to be an encouragement to all of us that God can speak through a donkey. Certainly he can speak through uh, any of us to tell people the, the, the truth as well. But uh, Peter has some very radical things to say about false teachers who follow the way of Balaam. Jesus is condemning them for following the way of Balaam. And when he addresses them, he identifies himself as the one that's coming with severe judgment. Jude also mentions Balaam in Jude 11. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of king and have run, notice again, greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and have perished in the rebellion uh, of Korah. So the Christians of Pergamos had a good confession of faith. They showed a degree of loyalty to the person of Jesus Christ. But their association with unbelievers in the city and a desire for monetary success, notice we saw that in both of those verses, it led to spiritual compromise. I mean, what are, you, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to compromise? Again, the compromise is a thing where you battle it over in your conscious, and rather than doing what is clearly what, what, what is directed in God's word, or what would be the moral or the right or the truth of a matter, you seek to rationalize it in some way, because after all, your situation is unique, your situation is different, and it's only this, it's only this time. It's only this time. Uh, but it leads to compromise. Sometimes we talk about uh, Christians, we can either be uh, thermometers or we can be thermostats. The thermometer just rises and falls and moves with what's going on in the environment. The thermostat is set, and then it ends up having an impact or controlling the environment itself. And, uh, and we're not to be people that, that change and ebb and flow with the mores of our society and how they, they radically change because they are radically changing. They're radically changing. I remember hearing Chuck Colson say at a, a point in time a number of years ago that it typically take the standards, the moral standards of a culture. It usually takes a generation for them to change. So over a, a 50 or 60 or 70 year period, what was considered immoral here 
now, 70 years later, might be accepted and considered moral now. It would take a long period before that would happen. He says changes are now coming by the decade. What was not accepted 10 years ago is accepted now. What is not accepted now will be different in terms of morals and especially sexual morals uh, in our own society. What is not accepted now if the trend continues, will be accepted in 10 years by the general public. And as Christians, we have to figure out what we're going to do. Are we going to compromise our view in these areas or, or not? Uh, and sometimes it might involve your job and your finances, uh, the priorities of, uh, of your life. And when you do, you're going the way of, of Balaam. The second condemnation is because of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and we were introduced to this with the church at, uh, at Ephesus because there in, in chapter 2, verse 6, we read, uh, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So this is a doctrine that Jesus hates. We, uh, we mentioned the fact that it comes from two Greek words. Uh, again, we're familiar with the first one, Nike or, or victory. Laity, meaning people, victory over people. There's a controlling factor over people's lives. We said it could be one of two things. It could be sin that they've entered into that is controlling their lives. Or it could be talking about uh, uh, in a very heavy authoritarian leadership or false teachers that have come in the church that are also dominating and, and holding down people uh, in, in the church. Both of these things certainly Jesus would uh, would uh, would hate uh, apparently. Now we find that the believers in Pergamos have people in their fellowship who not only not only do they not hate that doctrine, they actually hold to the doctrine. Uh, God hates it, but they are holding to it, uh, and uh, and that's part of the concern in terms of the the judgment. Yeah, and again, the prevailing view that the Nicolaitans were kind of uh, antinomians, that is a sect at that time that were opposed to the law. And, uh, and uh, we could talk about the possible Gnostic influences over them and so forth. But uh, the key there can be for us in, uh, in verse 15. Notice verse 14. He mentions uh, eating things, sacrificed to idols, and committing immorality. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and then ties it together with verse 15 by saying, and likewise. So in terms of what's going on here and what Jesus hates that they're holding on to, Again, it involves committing sexual immorality and things that have to do with the worship of the idols of that particular uh, city. So again, compromise for this church is, uh, is an area that is, it's just, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's the same with us. I think it was worse then, but it's growing all the time. It's, it's a real concern. If you say something against homosexuality and that you believe that it's a sin, that it's immoral, that it's a perverse lifestyle, does that go over real big? You might get fired, you know, in a lot of particular jobs. You might get a lawsuit against you. If I said this, that statement in a pulpit in Canada, I could be fined or go to jail. And it's, uh, it's moving that way very quickly in Great Britain. Uh, rather than saying that's your freedom of speech, that's part of your faith, we can agree to disagree on this issue, rather it's considered a hate issue, uh, and now I'm branded as somebody that has a problem because now I'm homophobic. No, actually I'm okay, I have a wife and we get along great and I, I don't have any of those other, uh, other views. Actually I'm the one not with a problem, the other people are the ones with a problem. I, is this a reality? Uh, this stuff goes on all, all the time. Uh, sexual immorality, perverse lifestyles that would have never been accepted 10 years ago, 20 years ago. <clears throat> you can imagine the issues that we talk about today. 30 years ago, people would have said never, would never happen in this, this country. That we have to fight and protest at our state capitol in record numbers to try to save Marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, we're living in similar times. Uh, and Jesus says, I hate it when you compromise in these areas. You know why? Because he loves us. He knows it's going to destroy us. He knows it's going to destroy us as a people and as a, uh, and as a culture. He never, he never made us that way. He never wired us that way. And uh, 
I, I tell you, I've, again, to, to use the, the euphemism of the day, I've ne- never met anybody that was gay that was gay. There was nothing happy about them or about their lifestyle. And if you look at the statistics, they're hurting people. They're hurting people. Uh, I mean, their sexually transmitted disease are off the chart. Depression is off the chart. Suicide, off the chart. All the destructive behaviors that, that come along with that lifestyle uh, are there statistically, but it's never discussed. It's never talked about because that would be seen as negative. It might be viewed as hate speech and so forth, but it's just the reality. God loves us. He cares greatly about us. He, he created us to, to live in a certain way, and when we go out of these boundaries... It, it destroys us. And when as believers we're willing to compromise in, uh, in these areas, uh, it's something that uh, Jesus to this church says he eventually will come to judge. Now notice the third thing about this is that he will condemn them if they, they don't repent. He says he'll come quickly. He'll fight against them with the, the sword of his mouth. Now five of the seven churches are told to repent and so certainly there's no reason to think that churches today are any different than they were uh, in the first century. Uh, and in the New Testament, when it talks about repentance, it's usually a reference to unbelievers repenting of their sin, turning to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. But certainly as believers and individually, we're told to repent. But here we've got an entire church that's told to repent. Notice again, verse 16, repents or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them. Uh, Notice how it it changes. I'll come to you, those who have been faithful, those who haven't compromised, those who have had personal loyalty to my name and a public confession, I'll come to you, uh, and then I will fight against them that are actually in your church that really aren't saved. And that was going on in the church there. I and certainly we could say the, the truth of that for today as well. Uh, they've held the doctrines of Baal, the doctrines of Nicolaitan, sometimes denying the deity of Christ, compromising the terms of sexual immorality and even pagan worship. And, and those things are just growing dramatically uh, in our own culture. The fourth thing, Jesus promises an eternal compensation, verse 17. And, and these are always kind of fun to look at because it's for us. Again, as in the other letters, the promise is for the individual. It's to him who overcomes. And the, uh, the overcomers we've mentioned, we've gone back to 1 John. Same writer has stated very clearly, it's the overcomers that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not to the overcomers who have the, uh, the most activity or this or that or have done thus and so. It's to those, the overcomer is to... Is the, is the believer that has placed his faith in Jesus Christ. And notice the compensation will be hidden manna, and uh, kind of an interesting one. And again, uh, everything we've said in the book of Revelation, uh, to understand it, we have to decipher, decipher what is a metaphor, what is a simile, and what is a reference to something in the Old Testament. Is it literal or is it symbolic? So this is an Old Testament thing. What was the hidden manna in the Old Testament? And do you think of some manna that was hidden at one point in time? It was actually put in a jar. It was so hidden. It was actually locked in a box. It was so hidden. And we just uh, watched our documentary on Wednesday night about looking for the Ark of the Covenant. But remember, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was hidden manna. Uh, the, the manna was, uh, again, when the children of Israel left Egypt. They're in the, what we call the wilderness wandering and God provided for them daily by, by bringing down from heaven. They would go out in the morning. There would be uh, manna, which was a, a type of a wafer. They tried to describe it sweet like uh, honey and so forth. And, uh, and, of course, they didn't know what to call it. So they said, what is it? And that's what the word manna means in Hebrew. What is it? So every day they got up and went out and, what's for breakfast? What is it? What's for lunch? What is it? What's for dinner? What is it? And... Uh, I'm sure that got a little old. It was probably really a blessing that first day, but probably got old after, after four, 40 years. And I'm sure they tried, uh, I'm sure they had manna smoothies and manna cotti and a lot of other things. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, they took some of it to remind themselves of God's miraculous provision for them. They put it in a gold jar. They put it in the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. That's the hidden manna. So what does this have to do with us? Well, 
Jesus uh, connects it with himself in John chapter 6 and a couple of verses there for you. He says basically it was a symbol like so many things uh, of himself. He is that daily provision for our lives that God has, uh, has provided. John 6.35, uh, our same writer John, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And later in the chapter, verse 47, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. That is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of this world. So to him who overcomes, you get Jesus. (laughs) He's the the ultimate hidden manna. Uh, He is the bread that has come down from uh, from heaven. And if we eat of him or partake of him, uh, we shall live uh, forever. The second compensation is uh, is a little more difficult. It's this idea of a, a white stone and on that stone, a, a name is written that uh, no one knows except the one who, who receives it. So what's the white stone with a, a new name? And uh, there's a couple of different views, and there's several. And I, I won't even go into some of them because I think they're just too far out there. But uh, one of them is um, uh, stones were used in the ancient time to uh, render a verdict. Uh, so there was a black stone, the judge would have condemnation. White stone, you're acquitted, you're innocent. So Certainly that, there's no mention of a black stone, but there's some validity to that, that idea. Uh, the white stone, and certainly we have been pardoned or forgiven uh, from all of our sins, those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the second view is uh, interesting. Some choose to relate the stone to the stones in the, uh, the breastplate of the, uh, the high priest. And of course, there would be the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes that he would bear upon his chest uh, and upon his shoulders, remembering them before the Lord. They would be upon his heart. He would bear upon his shoulders and he would intercede before God uh, those 12 stones. So some kind of take this view and say that uh, the stone is likened to one of them, but the white represents purity and our sins being forgiven and, and so forth. Um, the third view that, uh, just to bring to you, I think is the most plausible, uh, is that within the Roman Empire, uh, the, uh, if they were going to hand out or give you a ticket to something, like to the circus or whatever might be going on, or even when they doled out food and bread, they actually gave it to you by giving you a white stone with your name written on it. And that was your ticket to, to get what was coming to you. It was your ticket to, uh, to enter in. And uh, I think that uh, uh, that has some, some pretty cool implications. Again, it's the, the idea that the white stone that is our ticket to heaven. <laughs> it's, uh, it's our ticket, our name written on it, something that's unique to us apparently so that we are able to, to go in. Uh, I, I read this kind of interesting thing about, uh, about new names that I thought was uh, interesting. 1977, a fish a merchant named Lee Lance traveled to Chile, discovered a, uh, a toothfish uh, that uh, the locals there never ate. They said it was too oily. So he changed the name to Chilean sea bass. And now it's, it's been used so much it's almost an extinction. Uh, the Canadians discovered an oil from the rape seed which uh, didn't go over real big, and so they changed the name to canola. And that, as an oil, has sold, sold pretty well. Uh, California Prune Board realized that the word prune and laxative were somehow <laughs> linked together, so that made marketing tough, so they changed the name on some of the packaging to dried plums. And in, and in a taste test, uh, it won every time. How did the prunes taste? Oh, okay. How about the dried plums? Oh, I like them, you know. And the, those have sold a lot better as well. Um, in the 1960s, Freda Kaplan, American produce importer, changed the name of the Chinese gooseberry to the kiwi fruit, and sales really took off, though it has nothing to do with New Zealand or kiwi or, or anything else. It was just a catchy little name. And of course, we're familiar here in the islands and have never thought of a fish as the dolphin fish. 
but it was a tough sail on the mainland until so they all started calling it also Mahi Mahi. But a dolphin, I'm not eating flipper. I don't care <laughs> how well it's prepared, I'm not eating flipper. But Mahi Mahi, no problem. I'll, Hawaiian fish, I'll give that a try. So uh, again, a new name in heaven. But here's the idea for us, and I think uh, we see this in, in Scripture all the time, is that uh, in the name of Jesus, it's not just a name. We say our prayers, we end them in the name of Jesus. It's not like 1040 over and out, you know, Jesus. It's we're praying in, the, uh, in his name, which represents his character, his power, uh, uh, and, and so forth. God's going to give us apparently a, a white stone with a new name written on it. And um, I, think for, it, I think it just speaks of a, a new life that we have, another dimension of life, another quality of life that we've never, never ex- experienced before. Uh, whether it's the, the stone that pardons, certainly it, it would be that. Whether it's the, the stone that's handed out that is our ticket to get in. Uh, I, I think both of those ideas would be familiar with these citizens and, and certainly be uh, applicable. Uh, but either way, it's something to rejoice over. Back in Luke chapter 10, you remember when Jesus sent the disciples out for their first kind of short-term missions trip. And, and he said that they would have power in his name to do miracles and so forth. And they did. Uh, and they came back rejoicing because the demons fled, uh, the sick were healed, and, and they were pretty, pretty pumped up over, over that whole thing. Uh, and in verse 17, uh, it says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw f- a Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, it's like, that's nothing though. That's nothing. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And, uh, and again, that relates to our, our stone. So each of these churches, there are certainly the introduction, which is an aspect of uh, the picture we get of the risen glorified Savior in chapter 1. In this case, it's a, it's a sword, a severity of judgment. And these guys are in, in perilous times and in a perilous place in terms of great hostility, great uh, satanic oppression over that city in their lives because it was the throne of Satan, uh, which again, that throne traces itself back to ancient Babylon, which is very present in our own culture today via the New Age movement, via a rise in in, uh, neo-paganism, via a rise in in many ancient religions that have come back around again. It brings with it a certain amount of satanic conflict and oppression uh, and those seeking to use that power uh, to basically change uh, the environment, how we view morals in our society, how we change what is right and good uh, so that uh, uh, man lives for himself in a selfish life and uh, no longer for others. We're, we're suffering because of it economically, uh, and certainly our, our families are, are, are ravaged be, because of it. Uh, and remember the words of Jesus last week that were so shocking as well, is that they are a synagogue of Satan. And, that, and that's such a hard term to accept, but he's trying to help us understand the problem isn't necessarily them, it's the power behind it. So if we want to get mad and we want to get upset, let's get on our knees and begin to do something about it. That's the idea. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of darkness that are trying to come against us. It's a spiritual means in which Kailua will be changed. The windward side will be changed. If our country is saved, it's very interesting. Places around the mainland, I've, I've read some little emails and little news highlights from Christian organizations. There's actually people uh, placing placards in their front yards in, in some cities across the country saying, please pray for our country. It's our only hope. And, uh, and I would say uh, amen to that. I don't think Satan lives here. I don't think this is his throne, but certainly we see his dominance in, in, in people's lives. And Jesus is very concerned over what he is commending them for, that we need to stand up in terms of a personal loyalty to the name of Jesus Christ, his deity and his sacrifice for our sins, 
And that requires us to publicly sometimes confess it to others, regardless of what it may cost us. And sometimes that may be financial. And Jesus says, we still need to speak the truth. And he says, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to condemn them. So he sees what's going on and he knows what's in, in our hearts. And he says, and remember, we're living for eternity. So for you in, in heaven, there's a white stone with your, with, your, uh, with your name written on it. And if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have your ticket to heaven.